We are grateful to welcome Terence Chang, president of the Connecticut Community Colleges and Universities, who will open with a, a welcome. President Chang is a first generation student who earned a bachelor's degree in English from Birmingham, Birmingham University and an MFA in fiction from the University of Miami, where he was a James Michener Fellow. As an English professor, I'm often asked, what can you do with an English degree? I'm happy to welcome President Chang, who exemplifies the many ways a career in English can flourish and lead to important roles, such as leading our system. So President Chang, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Gentile. Um, and I say all the time, you know, I'm, I'm a fiction writer. I make stuff up for a living. And that's why I'm good at being an administrator because God knows what we deal with any given minute, any given day. And uh, we gotta be fast on our feet, but uh, it, is, it is a real honor uh, to serve in this capacity. So again, uh, my name is Terrence Chang and I'm the president of our uh, CSCU system. And, you know, good morning. Thanks to everyone for being here and for giving me the time to, uh, you know, just share some thoughts with you. Uh, before I begin, I definitely want to thank uh, Dr. James Gentile and Dr. Colleen Richard uh, for inviting me just to be here today. You know, these kinds of events and programs, they don't happen without hard work and the leadership of our faculty. So thanks to you and the team for making this happen. You know, the, it just takes a lot of people to bring it all together. And I really appreciate that. You know, I have to tell you how much I appreciate the work of uh, the Center for Teaching, you know, at multiple institutions. Uh, I've had the opportunity uh, to work with Centers for Teaching and I've benefited from them. Uh, and it's clear that our Center for Teaching is a passionate, dynamic, holistically driven, you know, group and organization that focuses on teachers, on students and on outcomes. And, you know, that's exactly the way it should be, right? Um, teaching is a craft. And, and I, I know that many of us, we're all teachers here. And I know that we've had those conversations where folks who are not uh, in our trade in the game, um, they think it's easy. They think we can go up there, we read some books or, you know, we kind of go to the chalkboard back in the old days and we just kind of talk, um, but we all know that it's a craft and the motivation, the inspiration, the ingenuity that you need to stay on top of one's game, that's really vital. And that's what our students deserve and that's what the profession demands and deserves. So uh, no one can force you or make you wanna become a better teacher. You have to want that yourself. And that's what makes our faculty and the Schwab Conference and this Center for Teaching really special. So today's agenda, I was looking through it, it's full of really incredible opportunities for folks to work together, to be together, to you know, just make each other better. Uh, but the focus of the conference is particularly resonant to me, um, that topic of uh, mentoring. I'll tell you that as an immigrant and as a first generation student, uh, my folks, they didn't know what they didn't know, right? And I just remember very distinctly growing up and going through my educational experience from the, the earliest days and just kind of feeling like I wasn't a part of the story sometimes. And it's because I wasn't connected. So um, I was very fortunate to be able to rely on mentors. Uh, and I've done that throughout my whole life from a pretty early age and all the way through now my professional career. So to this day, I have people I can call who will give me the support I need when I need it. And, you know, I feel responsibility. So when people come to me and they look to me for guidance or input, I'll do my best to be there for them. And, you know, again, give them what they need when they need it. Uh, being a mentor, that's, that's a lifelong commitment. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate to have relationships that go back decades now in this capacity. Um, and I hope to perpetuate that with others. Uh, it's a special relationship. I know you all know this. And it's part of that really hard and uh, noble work that we do. That's what makes education special, right? We're in the people business. We're in the human business. And that's what makes us stronger and better as people and as a society. Uh, it's particularly impactful, as you all know, in, in our community colleges, where we serve 
so many students, uh, first generation students and students that weren't born with that proverbial spoon in the mouth. And you know, you all play an enormous role in cultivating just a, a better a better society by helping our students. And so I really thank you for that. Uh, someone who certainly knows what it means to be a great teacher and a great mentor is our uh, honored guest and keynote speaker, Congresswoman Johanna Hayes. So thank you for being here, Congresswoman. We're really just thrilled to have you. Uh, Congresswoman Hayes knows the transformational impact a great teacher can have. She's a former National Teacher of the Year, and she has literally you know, been a part of transforming the lives of thousands of Connecticut students. And now as a member of our congressional delegation, she's just one of 85 members of the House with a background in education. And she has become a powerful advocate in Washington for our system and our state. And so, uh, and I would also be remiss if I didn't mention, she is a double alumna of our system with degrees from Naugatuck Valley Community College and Southern Connecticut State University. So CSCU is definitely well represented in Washington, DC. Uh, I'm thrilled and grateful that she's here to be with us to share her insights and her experience. So I'll conclude with, uh, I always do this, you know, whether it's a speech or some remarks, I like to have a little quote or kind of corny saying, but um, that's, just, that's just the way I am. Uh, many of you will know the saying, uh, iron sharpens iron. And uh, that's you. That's you. You make each other better. Today, days like today, you make each other better and stronger. So I know you're going to have a great day. And I'm just very thankful that you all are here doing the work that you're doing. And I appreciate you letting me have some time. And I'll stick around because I want to hear the Congresswoman's remarks. And uh, you know, we'll have a we'll have a good time today. Thanks, everybody. So welcome, Congresswoman Hayes. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm very excited. Uh, full disclosure, I read through the ASK and the Schwab conference and what was going on here today. And I really didn't understand it, but I didn't care because I'm so partial to our Connecticut State University system and especially the community college system that I figure, you know, the answer is yes and I'll, I'll work my way through it. So uh, I logged on because I wanted to hear the introduction and really hear about the work that you've been doing and so happy to support and proud to be a part of that. Um, I just want to say to your comment about um, President Chang, there's 85 members of the House who have some experience in education. I can tell you all educational experience is not created equally. There are even fewer number, when you look at that number and you really begin to boil it down, there are a handful of members who have actually classroom experience. There are even fewer members who have community college experience. So the work that you do is so deeply personal for me on so many levels. And it really requires a different level of investment from me at the federal level to really amplify what you do in your respective roles. I thank you so much for inviting me to share today. And I thought a little bit about this topic of mentorships and, and administrators and really was trying to figure out where my work would fall into this. And much like it always happens, you know, you go right to the beginning. Oftentimes we think of leadership as starting at the top and what the people at the top have to do, but just like everything else, it starts at the bottom. You know, it is putting those structural and institutional building blocks in place. And I just wanna share with you a little bit about my experiences um, coming into these roles of leadership. I will apologize in advance, I'm on pins and needles because I keep hearing all of this construction outside of my office window, but I guess that's the unintended consequence of signing an infrastructure bill into law and bringing all of these jobs back to Connecticut. <laughs> so, <laughs> So it's everywhere. There's there's construction everywhere outside of my office, which is a which is a really amazing thing. 
But when we talk about creating leadership opportunities, I remind everyone that that is central to both attracting teachers to this profession, retaining administrators and teachers in this profession, and improving outcomes for the students that we serve. The most effective educators are the ones who have been allowed to grow and develop professionally and use their talents in your school and community. I think about some of my own experiences and I was reminded to, um, as I was thinking of when I found out I was going in the running for a national teacher of the year. So as part of my application, I had to submit a bio and a resume. And I remember reading my resume and I was really disappointed at how shallow it seemed. I had to really sit and think about what, 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 what had I done to demonstrate leadership potential? And my resume did not express anything. I was a history teacher. I talked about lessons, but I really didn't have any leadership examples in this resume. So I decided to make a list of all of the activities I had been involved in, in my school and in my community. And after about 20 minutes, I had filled several sheets of paper. My list included things like being a member of the Connecticut Urban Consortium, which was a group of educators who facilitated professional leadership and collegiality amongst teachers. I was the chairperson of the SOAR Review Board, which handled all of the discipline at our school's honors program. I was a lead teacher in our 21st century after school program. I had served as a NIAS committee chair and was in charge of the committee on our community engagement for school. I had been a part of a partnership with TAF Global Leadership Initiative and started um, community service and engagement in, in our city. I was the co-founder of the Hope Club at our school, which stood for helping out people everywhere and engage students in service learning. I had um, was on my school governance council and met uh, every other week with parents and community members to think about how we could change the trajectory of our students and really engage our teachers with our community. I had all of the, these things like this on this list that were nowhere on my resume because I think that as teachers, as administrators, we only think of the things that fall under our respective titles. And what I was forced to do was to think about activities that fell outside of my traditional role, but were also leadership skills that are all transferable. I think far too often we are waiting to get the promotion and then really demonstrate leadership. But it is those things that we are already doing when we close the door and do the work and are aligned in our vision that also qualify as leadership. As I reflect back, I realize that I've always been a leader. Being selected as the National Teacher of the Year only gave me a title for the roles that I was already engaged in. I was leading people long before I was ever identified as a leader. And building capacity in my, I was building capacity in my organization and in my community before I ever was given the task of organizing the community. I'm a product of the community where I teach, you know, I knew people, I was having human conversations and using that to inform my decision making and my work. All of those things are leadership skills. I was guiding my students and helping them build capacity. I was building capacity in my colleagues long before I was given the title of National Teacher of the Year. I say all these things because that is the true definition of leadership. And I think what the last two years have taught us, what this pandemic has taught us, is that we have to break some of those traditional molds of what we think this is supposed to look like or how we think this is supposed to play out. Oftentimes, in a mentor-mentee relationship, we really don't think about it in the symbiotic way in which it should be used. You know, as both people are learning from each other, both people have something to offer. And if we are to move forward, if we are truly to embrace the lessons of the last two years, we have to recognize that leadership's, leadership is encapsulated in one's ability to have the wisdom to know when to step up and take charge or to step back and empower others to do so. I'm very excited when people talk about 
um, all of the opportunities I had in my classroom and you know what I was able to do for my students as a teacher. But in my role, I have the opportunity to explain to them what my students did for me. They educated me on their backgrounds, on their cultures, on the things that were important to them. They made me a better teacher. President Chang said that um, if you don't wanna be a better teacher, and I stopped listening to the end of that sentence because if you don't wanna be a better teacher, then you shouldn't be a teacher. Every single one of us has the ability to learn something. I'm so excited to have any interaction with the community college system because nothing is unique about community college. As you may all know, I went back to college, started at Naugatuck Valley Community College in Waterbury after having dropped out of high school and gone to a program for pregnant and parenting teens. So I was very nervous about walking back into that school environment many years later and, and thriving and enjoying it in the way that I did when I was in high school. But what I found was that I was not unique. There were so many people just like me. There were so many people with similar experiences. There was so much experience and talent and just uh, a robust community of people who were there to support each other. And I think that really, that human capital is what will help us navigate our way out of this. When I used to teach my students history, there was uh, a speech by Booker T. Washington that we would read. It was his very famous Atlanta Exposition speech. He gave that speech in 1895 at um, the Atlanta Exposition is almost like, I would explain to my students, it's like the Big E. It was a huge agricultural fair where all the farmers came and they had invited Booker T. Washington to speak. And he starts his story by Telling, he starts his speech by telling the story of this ship that was stranded at sea. And they had been in the water for days and they saw a friendly ship coming by and they're waving the flag trying to get the attention of this other ship. And they're saying, you know, we need water. We're going to die of thirst. We don't know what to do. And the captain of the ship yells back from the bow, cast down your buckets where you are. Cast down your buckets where you are, because this, this crew was in the middle of fresh water, saying they were dying of thirst and they didn't have water and not appreciating that if they just dropped their buckets right where they were, they had everything they needed. I think that that is incredibly relevant, especially for this group, because as you are seeking you know, speakers and leaders and inviting people into your conference, People like me, I remind you just to cast down your buckets where you are. When I was at Naugatuck Valley Community College, I had the honor and privilege of being taught by uh, a sociology professor named um, um, Lucy Hurston, who was the niece of Zora Neale Hurston, who was in the middle of writing a very famous collection for her family and in the years to years later in Congress, I'm voting on legislation to honor and recognize Zora Neale Hurston. And I had the privilege at a community college of seeing and, and experiencing the same documents that we were talking about in Congress. While I was at Naugatuck Valley, we had a botanical program and a greenhouse that really informs much of the decision-making and my work on the Committee of Agriculture because what I did not know then, but I definitely know now, is that my district, the 5th Congressional District, greenhouses are the number one industry. And I had the ability to learn all of these things right at that college campus. So I know, I know who are amongst this group. I know the people that are engaged and work in, a, in our Connecticut community college system. So I say to you, we have to just utilize those people, you know, pull some of those talents and skill sets out of people. It doesn't take a title for someone to be a leader in a school or a community. Cast down your buckets where you are. I think that we have a diverse population. We have an extremely talented population. We just have to engage those people and bring those talents out of them. 
one of the things that I learned is that we're not always going to get to a place in the same way. Everyone is going to have a different way of being and doing. Everyone is going to have, you know, something that works just for them. And we have to recognize the value in those experiences. I think one of the things that we have to do is first just make sure we're aligned in our values. If we truly believe, and whether you are an educator, whether you are an elected official, whether you are a CEO of a company, that everyone has a human and civil right to high quality education and opportunities. And then you make the decision to do your part to help them to get there. How that happens or what that looks like doesn't really matter. There are going to be different approaches as long as the outcomes are the same. So I, I just think that if we take advantage of the richness that is inherent in our school communities, in our environments, if we take the time to build capacity in ourselves and then share that capacity with others, if we take the time to listen and appreciate that other people have something valuable and important to offer, then we really can grow as a community and, and as a system and pull more people in. We are going to be at this point in our history where we have to decide what happens next. I know that college is not for everyone. I know that all of the students that stood before me do not see education as the future to their successes. So we have to make sure that there is a variety of experiences, whether it be internships or apprenticeships or work study programs or skills training programs, whatever it takes to show young people or anyone that you have worth and we are going to help you get to where it is you are trying to go. Those are the things that I try to do. I try to do in my, my classroom and that I try to do even now in Congress. Um, Dr. Chang said that, uh, people think that we just read books and and you learn a skill set. I would I would argue that reading books was the easiest part of me being a teacher. It was all of the things that I had never prepared for that presented the most challenges throughout my day. And the one thing that I know separated me with fidelity, the one thing that I know because I, I had I had somewhat of an imposter syndrome when I was named the National Teacher of the Year. I mean, how could I not? I I knew I wasn't the best teacher in the country. Come on. Like, I, I knew that there were even teachers in my building who were a lot more solid than me. But what I knew for sure was that I cared about my kids. And I knew that they knew that I cared about them. And I knew that they remembered how I made them feel after every interaction. And that being my North Star and my guiding light forced me to be a better teacher, forced me to be reflective forced me to consider every opportunity and, and use it to, to breathe life into my kids. Um, when I was named Connecticut Teacher of the Year, there's an experience that sticks out in my head uh, because I was at, I said, you know, I've never given a speech in front of a crowd of people. I don't know what to say, which again, I had given a speech every single day to at least 27 kids on some topic in history. So I had to, you know, um, reprogram my mind. But I was so nervous about giving the speech at the Bushnell. And the direction I was given was generally people talk about a teacher that inspired them. They talk about, you know, who is the teacher that really forced you to become a teacher or inspired you to do better. And interestingly enough, the teacher that I talked about was a teacher who was mean to me. It was a teacher who had made a really nasty comment about my grandmother. Um, I've told this story before, but I think it's worth telling to this group. Um, when I was, it was, I was an elementary school teacher and you know, for parents night, you used to have to put your papers in a folder and your parents come in, they get the folder and they take it home. And I remember I would always try to be the first one in school the next day to get my folder because my grandma didn't come to open house. Um, my grandma was elderly. She was sick. She didn't drive. We didn't have buses at night in our community, which incidentally in the city of Waterbury, we had never had buses that ran after 6 p.m. until Dr. Daisy Coco de Filippis at Naugatuck Valley came 
and worked with the mayor to have evening buses so that students could um, get to campus. So that was how late buses came to the city of Waterbury, but we had never had late buses throughout my, my entire childhood. And I remember my teacher telling another teacher in the hallway that that family never comes. You know, they don't care about their kids. And I was devastated. And you can imagine me as a little girl wanting to speak up and say to this teacher, actually, that's not true. My grandma does care about us. She just doesn't have a car. And, but I didn't have the courage to do that. I didn't know how to say to this teacher. And here I was being celebrated as the, the Connecticut teacher of the year. And the teacher who I wanted to be in that audience was her. And I say that because with this work comes a tremendous responsibility. Every person who engages in the field of education has a burden and a responsibility, but also an incredible gift to pour life into someone who may be lacking, to provide encouragement for someone who may not have it, to stand in intercession for someone who doesn't believe in themselves until they can stand on their own. This teacher took that from me. And even 30 years later, as I was being celebrated in the profession, she was the teacher that was playing in the back of my head. I tell you that because we have so many people who are going to be changing professions or for the first time in their life saying, you know what, I'm gonna go back to school or I'm going to step out on faith and try to get that promotion. And the words that we use and the inter interactions that we have with them will either breathe life in them or take it away. We have a tremendous, tremendous just opportunity, opportunity to use the gifts that we have been given to share with other people, to encourage people to step out on faith and go back to school, to to take a leap, to guide someone through a period of their life that may be incredibly dark, to re-engage people who may have experienced tremendous loss over the last two years. Don't let it be lost on you how important that is. I would not be where I am today if community colleges, if public schools, if people who had some, types, some type of agency and advocacy hadn't shared that with me. Everything I learned about school, I learned at school. From K-12 all the way through my academic years, I can tell you that um, <laughs> just, I have so many stories about Naugatuck Valley. We used to, I remember when I was in school, we had to fill out a paper FAFSA. Nobody in my family knew how to fill out that form. And I remember the secretary in the financial aid office staying after the office closed with me to go over this form with me. Those are experiences that can't be duplicated. They can't be replicated. So while we're talking about leadership and mentoring and what that means, I remind you that your title doesn't define what leadership looks like. The role that you hold, the salary that you command does not even quant is not quantifiable when we talk about the work and the impact and the impressions that you make. If that secretary had said to me, well, you're old enough to know how to fill out a FAFSA and you're an adult. I shouldn't have to sit here with you and go through this line by line with you. I might have been discouraged and walked away and never filled out that paper and never gone back to school. But she didn't do that. She didn't do that. She stayed after with me, not once, but on multiple occasions to go over this booklet with me, to make sure I sent it in on time, to make sure I applied for any funding that was available. That's true leadership. So as you engage in this conference, I really think that now is the time for to reset and provide reflection and really think of creative ways to draw the leader out of every single person on your campuses, whether it is the person in charge of security, or the person who works in the school cafeteria. All of these people are going to be interacting with the student body and it is a lost opportunity if every one of those interactions isn't meant to breathe life into someone and instill confidence and be supportive in all of the people that we have. I also have to say, I am incredibly, incredibly excited about just on so many levels. I have so many neurons firing off, but the partnership that Capital Community College has just engaged in with Morehouse College. I am 
you know, from city of Waterbury taught in a majority minority school and an urban district. And I can't tell you how many of my students had never even heard of an HBCU, had never seen people like them in leadership positions. So it's important and it matters. It matters to make sure that we are stepping outside of the traditional mold, that we are seeking out new opportunities, that you are doing everything that you can to really create a network of people to support students through the entire continuum. The other thing that I know for sure is that you cannot support students without supporting the people who stand in front of them. So making sure that educators and administrators and all of the people who are a part of that continuum feel respected and supported and valued in their roles. On my committee of education and labor, one of the things that was the most shocking for me was that you know, everybody was trying to improve outcomes for students. There was legislation and we talked a lot about what we could do for students. But anytime there was a conversation about what can we do for the adults that we are putting in front of students so that they feel supported, so that they have the resources, it felt like an us against them argument. There was this perception in Congress that if you are supporting students, then you're taking away from teachers, or if you're trying to advocate for teachers that it's taking away from what students need. I challenge you to say that we have to do both. We have to do both. The people who are standing in front of our students, the people who are interacting with our students, the people in the financial aid offices, the people in the, the counseling services, all of those people create the full continuum. All of those people are the ones that really help to foster the successes of the community college system and the state university system. So all of those people need support it need to be supported. I'm very excited that you have this conference annually and you are being reflective in your practice and looking at ways to build capacity in all of your stakeholders. And I can't tell you how important that is. I felt like it was the ultimate betrayal for me to leave the classroom. All I ever wanted to be was a teacher. I mean, I was the little girl who play school and, you know, volunteered to pass out papers and clean the chalkboard and, you know, got just everything, line up dolls. I just wanted to be a teacher so badly. In my mind, it is the most noble profession. When I became teacher of the year, I came out of the classroom for a year and I traveled as an ambassador for public education. And I remember my students saying, I don't understand, you're teacher of the year, now you don't teach? What does that mean? You know? And when I made the decision to run for Congress, I think that the, the hardest part of that decision was knowing that I was leaving the classroom because I felt that really good teachers, really effective teachers, you know, the administrators that are that care the most, the people that are our most valuable resources leave. And by making that decision, I felt like I was one of those people. But I recognize today that we need people who care about kids and, and education and opportunities for success at every level, not just in the classroom, not just in administrative seats, but in the halls of Congress, legislating, appropriating the funds and the resources. We need people in the community. We need people in business. We need everybody just doing their part to make sure that we are supporting the structures that are in place. So I've somewhat forgiven myself because I know that this work is valuable as well. I know that from Congress, I can take my experiences from Naugatuck Valley Community College and advocate for additional and increased funding for community college systems. I know that in Congress, I can take my experiences having worked in the Waterbury Public Schools with kids who have given up on themselves to make sure that we have wraparound services to hold them, you know, to support them until they could stand on their own. I can make sure in Congress that we are infusing the pipeline with, it, with diverse educators who are well positioned and supported and have all of the tools that they need to be the most effective teachers when they stand in front of our kids. I know that we are creating the next generation of the workforce 
preparing young people for today's jobs, not a 100 year old economy. So all of those things I would argue are equally as valuable and equally as important. So in closing, I would just remind you that there is value in the work that every member of your organization does. And it would behoove you to seek out those talents, to find that, that value, to ask people what they're good at and incorporate that into the work that you're doing. Cast down your buckets where you are. There's fresh water right beneath you. Thank you. I think you're clapping. I can't hear you. <laughs> We all have our mutes on. So yes, we're all clapping. But even this, I can tell you that I, there were people that I worked at the beginning of this pandemic, people, you know, there was a lot of talk, oh, we'll just have virtual learning. And I reminded my colleagues, every educator in every district is not equipped with the capacity for virtual learning. Every educator doesn't have the skill set. This is, it is a, it's a skill to be able to flip a computer and teach virtually. Um, one of my greatest strengths as an educator was feeding off of the energy of my students, having engaging interaction back and forth. And this idea that um, all you have to do is turn on a computer and teach in the same way really gives short shrift to the work that educators actually do. So. What we have done in the past is going to be so different now as we emerge. And I hope that we will seize these as opportunities to say, let's rethink the way we're doing things. You know, let's let's look at, you know, pr productivity and think that maybe, you know, maybe we can have a hybrid model or maybe we can engage people in different ways or maybe we can, you know, begin to make sure that our educators are trained to teach in a virtual setting. There's so many opportunities coming out of this pandemic. And, and I hope that we will not recede because we're fatigued, but we'll lean in and really make sure that we are just embracing all these opportunities and, and using it to draw people in as opposed to pushing people away. So while being virtual is by far not my greatest strength or not something that I would prefer because I just love people. I'm a, a history teacher by profession. I am a storyteller um, and, and I just love to hear from other people. But I've also learned that over the past year and a half or two years or two months, I don't know time, I don't know what time is anymore in this pandemic. I've also learned that um, it's also an opportunity to, to just shatter the mold and really start all over. And as a history teacher, that excites me. That really excites me because every movement in our history, every moment in our history really ends with, and we were at our worst, you know, we were broken down and we emerge, you know, after the civil rights movement, after the women's rights movement, you had all of these people who had never been involved, never been engaged, just step up and say, well, I have something to offer. And I'm excited about the possibility of that happening right now. You know, people who had never seen themselves in a leadership role, who were forced to do something outside of their comfort zone in the last two years, will now say, you know what? I did that and I was pretty good at it. So I want to help somebody else do it. I would just add also, uh, Congresswoman. It's not just what we learned as, as teachers, we learned so much about our students' capacities and challenges. I know at my college, the discovery that students were taking a class on a smartphone because they didn't have a, a tablet or computer, they didn't have Wi-Fi access, or they were sitting in like a college parking lot trying to get free Wi-Fi, but I think it makes us aware of we really have to think broadly when we think about our students' needs, because I don't think until the pandemic, we were thinking as I well. was, <laughs> I was, <laughs> but you. I'm excited that now no one can ever say, I did not know it was this, right. you know, no one can ever say that when I, I, I mean, I remember when I enrolled in Naugatuck Valley, I didn't have a computer. 
I remember one of my classmates gave me a word processor that she was throwing away so that I could type my papers. I remember going to the math lab every day after class because I didn't own um, a, a graphing calculator and they had some that you can borrow. So we have to recognize that we are we have people who are who are breaking down exceptional barriers just for the opportunity to have an education. And every single one of us has the ability to embrace that and to guide them along. Uh, young people are amazing. Young people are formidable and talented and really have the capacity to be whoever they, they choose to be. Uh, and for so many of them, they don't have a mentor. They've never seen it done. They don't know what is on the other side and they give up before they get there. Um, and I know that in the community college system, you're not just dealing with young people, but there is so much promise in their potential. There is so much there that is untapped. And for any of you, if you ever have the ability or the opportunity to, to just invest in those people, you know, I, I, you know, I, I always say, I know what happens, you know, when people choose to ignore the obstacles and focus on, you know, the child, because I am what happens when people choose to ignore all of that background noise and say, I'm going to give you what you need to succeed. And for me, it was never just one person. It was a village of people, a community of people. And that's why I love that you're having this conversation with not just one group of faculty, but everyone who have very different roles and very different jobs because every single one of those roles is important. I wanna open this up to questions uh, for Congresswoman Hayes. So you can put your question in the chat or if you wanna raise your hand and ask a question. And Representative Hayes, you have many kudos in the chat as well. <laughs> Kudos in the chat. <laughs> thank you so much for your powerful words. Uh, thank you for the much needed inspiration An extremely motivating speaker. The message came at a perfect time. Thank you so much. Love your story, inspiring talk, and for taking your skill set and background into the public policy arena. I love that last one because I was probably, I remember when I was a finalist for National Teacher of the Year. There's four finalists. Um, I had never heard of the Teacher of the Year program. I didn't know it existed. I didn't, so it was overwhelming. I'm trying to consume all of this information. And all three, one of the finalists had been heavily engaged in his local teachers union and was very vocal in the community. Another one of the finalists knew he wanted to go into public policy in DC. And another one had run for local office. I was the least political of the four of us. And I approached this in this almost Pollyanna-ish way. And my response was, I just want to teach. You know, I just want to create opportunities for kids who otherwise would not have them. And even today, I tell people that my work is not about politics. It's about policy. It's about creating good policy that opens up opportunities for everybody. You know, it's about making sure that people in, in every community has access to all of these opportunities and then the rest is on them, you know, to do the hard work, to do their part, to put in the effort, but the opportunities are there. And I think that's the way, um, I, I just am so, I, I thank God every day that I still approach this work in that way when I was in the classroom, my North Star was always, when I wasn't really sure if I made a good decision or felt uncomfortable about an interaction I had with, with a, a child, I would always ask myself, is this the education you want for your child? You know, is this the way you would want a teacher or an administrator to speak to your child? Is this the second chance you would want someone to give to your child? And I would conduct myself accordingly. In Congress, I asked myself that same question. Is this the policy you would want for your family? You know, is this the healthcare plan? Is this the, the school setting? Is this, you know, 
the pension or the provisions that you would want for your family. And I try to operate in the same way um, because the the organizational and institutional structures, whether it be in a university, whether it be in our government, those trickle down and impact everything that everyone else does. So I think if we start from a good place, if we can agree that, again, everyone has the civil and human right to a high quality education and every opportunity that goes along with that, if that's where we center our work, then everything else will flow from that. Um, and I, I just believe it. Um, and, and I think that I, I, I just pulled up the chat and the, the question from Lauren O'Leary about how do I think my teaching philosophy has changed now that I have had mentors outside of the realm of education. And I guess my response is it hasn't. And I'm so incredibly grateful for that because I still ask that guiding question. Is this the education you would want for your child? What I am forced to do, however, having stepped outside of the classroom space is really consider all of the perspectives that other people bring to the conversation and have a newfound appreciation for that. Um, when I was a classroom teacher, quite frankly, I would say, you know, what does that person know about what I do in the classroom? You know, teachers feel like I close the door and I teach and I am the most authentic voice to what happens in education. As a legislator, and even when I was teacher of the year, I began to appreciate, wait a minute, it's not just me. It is the school board. It is the administrators. It is the textbook companies. It is the parents. So you really have a much more um, full and robust picture of all of the people who um, impact student outcomes. And I think probably that part has changed. But at the core, I, you know, my guiding question is still, is this the education you would want for your child? I have to consider, you know, from a legislative perspective, what is the pay for? How are we going to get this done? You know, what, how are we making one decision over another decision? What is the safety aspect? All of the things that as a teacher, I never had to consider. So I am much more aware of all of the pieces of the pie. But at the end of the day, I still want to make sure that the sum total of all of those efforts is improved outcomes for students. Um, that, is, that is my line in the sand. That is the non-starter for me. When, when students, when we're taking away from students that we're doing something wrong. And, and by improving outcomes, that means, that means supporting educators, infusing the pipeline, diversifying the profession, bringing down the cost of college tuition, making sure that we are engaging and attracting uh, young people sooner. It's all of the parts of that continuum that I have a newfound appreciation for. But at the end of the day, we all have to be comfortable when, we're, when we walk away from the work with saying, I would have done the exact same thing if that were my child. Representative Hayes, um, Tamara has a, a question, her hand was raised. Good morning. Hi, I'm Tamara. I'm our AVP for teaching and learning for the community colleges. Um, thank you for your, your wise words this morning. One of the things you said at the beginning, you talked about listing the things that are part of your job description, right? And that people really get into that bucket and they don't really share a comprehensive view of leadership or their leadership. Um, and storytelling was something you also shared. How have you been mentored over the years to share your story and to share a comprehensive view of your leadership? And how do you now mentor others to do that? I wish I could say that it was intentional, but it wasn't. Um, as you can imagine, when I was in that story, you know, when life was happening, I was ashamed of many of the, the pieces and it was things that I didn't want to share. And as same thing as part of the National Teacher of the Year process, I had to write a bio and I remember being feeling completely depleted when I wrote the first draft of my bio and some you know, well-intentioned people said, we'd like to take a look at it and we can help you. And there was a line through three paragraphs of that bio and it was replaced with one sentence. I was the first in my family to go to college. And that was, I felt sad and ashamed by that because the part that was erased was 
you know, as a teenage mom, I grew up in public housing. My mother was an addict. My grandmother raised my brother and I. It was all of these things that really were a lot more important than the fact that I was the first in my family to go to college. And I feel like we always want to celebrate the end of the journey, but not all of the obstacles that it took because those are equally as, if not more important. So I made the decision in that application process that no, I am including the entire bio, not just that one sentence, because I know that I had been in a school for 15 years where many of my students shared my similar experiences. So they needed to hear that. And they knew about all these things. So I felt like I would be received as a fraud to my students if at the national level, I couldn't share this. I shared my story because I didn't want someone else to share it for me. I didn't want, you know, a headline to be, she's the national teacher of the year and she was a high school dropout. How is that possible? But what I didn't expect to happen as a result of sharing that story was the power that came along with owning my narrative. And I did it over and over and over again. And I can tell you with fidelity, every room that I've ever spoken, someone either contacted me on the way out or said something during the session that said, I needed to hear that, or the same thing happened to me, or my students need to hear this. So even though it was not traditional for the National Teacher of the Year to start a keynote with, I was a high school dropout, I recognize that there are more students than there are National Teachers of the Year. And there were more young people who resonated, who, who those experiences resonated with. And how do I encourage other people to do the same? I think that by give me doing it at this level, I think gave other people permission because many of the people I talked to, their story wasn't as bad as mine. Like they didn't have they didn't make trifling decisions in the way that I did. So it was like, oh, wait, I'm not that bad. I could tell my little, <laughs> I could tell my little blemish. But also that people recognize it's not just me. And that's what people need to hear. You know, you don't know how many, it, 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 it is maddening for me when I see former students and I'm like, well, what are you doing? They're like, oh, well, I'm just at the community college. And they say it and you can see their body language changes. And I'm like, I don't understand what that means. You know, you are in school and that is good enough. And don't you ever be ashamed of the fact that while you had plans to go across country and do all these amazing things in your head, when reality set in, you realize that the school across the street was the best option for you and your family. I need for you to recognize that that is still good enough. So I can feel myself getting angry even as I'm telling the story. <laughs> so I think I started like just sharing because when you allow your light to shine, whatever, you know, whatever light that may be, you give other people permission to do the same. And it normalizes the fact that not everybody has the same experiences. Not everyone comes from a two parent professional household that has a college fund and a plan in place. Lots of people fall down and have to get up and have to start all over and, and drop out and start again. And that is also normal. So I, I started to share not because I was brave and bold and, and wanted to lead in that way. I did it because I was hurt by the fact that the people who were already in those positions thought that that was something that I should keep to myself. Thank you. And thank you for being bold and brave. <laughs> well, now I'm bold and brave. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Actually, it made me cry just a little bit. So, um, so Allison McCarthy, who is one of my colleagues at Tunxis, is one of the uh, individuals who are piloting a mentoring program for our students this semester and bringing it full scale to the fall. Our program connects them with the mentor uh, and a group, uh, let's see, group of peers and the community. With your experience as a teacher and thinking back to yourself starting at community college as a student, what would you say to students to help them see the value of participation? I don't even think it's what you say to them. I think it's what you show them. You know, for, for me, I remember I wanted to be a teacher so badly. And I came from, a, most of my colleagues had come from families of educators. Their mom was a teacher, their grandmother, their father. 
and they knew what they had to do. They knew that there was going to be a praxis at the end of their teaching experience. They already knew what school they wanted to do student teaching at. And I remember every part of this, this journey to me was, I didn't realize I had to do that. Or how do I map out what happens next if I don't even know what it's supposed to look like? I think the best thing that we can do for young people is show them. You know, kids have to see it to be it. When we share our stories, just like Tamara's question, and they say, wait, you were the same as me and look at what you've done. You know, when we, and that's why, again, I'm so, so incredibly thrilled about the partnership with Morehouse because now you can have young men, young black men, and I'm just going to say it, who have very different experiences, who are less than 2% of the educator population, who have never seen it. And many of them will go through their whole academic journey, having never been in contact with, you know, a black male education professional. But then to see people in those roles, it, 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 it gives permission to do all of the things that, that they wanna do, to see, you know, women in finances and in STEM, to see, um, you know, I listened to the president, immigrants as college presidents. The best thing that we can do for our kids, especially at the community college setting, when we are going out into just very diverse communities, is to engage our young people with a network of, of professionals who are on the other side of those experiences. I can tell you, I taught history and government for 15 years, and I told kids about all of these aspirational ideas about if you work hard enough, you can do this. And, you know, these are the doors that are open for you. No lesson that I ever taught was as effective as them seeing me getting sworn into the United States Congress. No lesson that I've ever taught was as effective as them seeing that I'm the first African-American woman to ever represent the state of Connecticut in Congress, you know, 250 years later. So uh, I really think uh, just exposing the kids in these programs to as many opportunities, whether it be, I remember writing a grant many, many years ago to take my students to New York to see a play, The Lion King. And I, I taught, grew up, lived in the city of Waterbury, where we are 90 minutes from both Boston and New York. And, you know, theater and the arts and museums and culture is, is robust and rich in this part of the country. And I had kids who had never been to a theater, who had never seen a live performance. And I, I'll never forget one of my students, Alessandra, she was crying on the bus. And I didn't understand why she was crying. And she kept repeating the phrase, I've never seen the music, which I didn't understand or appreciate because I had seen an orchestra in my life before. But the image of that orchestra coming up in that theater and every sound that she heard, her seeing the instrument that was making it was so incredibly, incredibly palpable for me because these are the kids where I use those experiences to teach them how to debate to teach them how to describe what they were feeling. And I never thought, I'm getting all emotional now because I never thought that, I was like, we're gonna go to New York, have a good time, go to dinner, go to a theater show. I never thought that it would be transformational for this little girl who had never seen an orchestra. So those are the types of opportunities. And it's not just in our schools, there is, an intersectionality between everything that I do. You know, I yesterday I, I went on a bird walk at, at one of our parks in the city and a local reporter asked me why it was important. And I told him, I said, because the kids in this community need open spaces just like the kids everywhere else. You know, they need to have trails and, and bike paths and all of the things because those are experiences that they bring with them into the workforce. So making sure that, um, Geography is not the indicator of what is accessible and available to young people in these programs. As you are creating mentorship programs, bring people in and take them out because there is a whole world, I think, that we take for granted that they know about and they don't. And, and I would just like to add uh, for myself, uh, I'm a social worker and I coordinate the human services program at Tungsys. 
And I, uh, my, my major at uh, graduate school was community organization. So I love to take the students to the Capitol and to say to them, this is your house. This is um, where you know your voice can be heard. And these students had never been there before. They were scared to death to go and speak to their uh, representatives because they thought something would happen. And um, and on the way home on the bus, I, I the, the students had the same you know experience like that your student talked about. You know that that they could make a difference, that they could be heard. And and then those students then go mentor other students to. Uh, to go to the Capitol. So it's just a, it's an, a transformational in lots of ways. I had a, a memory come up and on my social media today. It's funny that you would say that because first of all, I think there are no coincidences. Like I have had a life that has been draped in grace. I have been blessed at every step of the way. And I realized all of the experiences that I had that seemed like hardships as I was growing up that I wish didn't happen to me. I'm so grateful for every one of those experiences because they helped me to legislate. But this morning I had a Scholastic Junior article that came up that I'd never seen. I don't know how I missed this article, but it was written. They interviewed this young girl in 2018. And the title of the article was, I got this teacher elected to Congress. And they interviewed her and she talks about how she had watched on TV how elections were more entertaining than any TV show she had ever seen. And then she decided she wanted to get involved. So she Googled who's running for office and she found my name and she direct messaged me on Facebook and I responded and she was like, I'd love to help. I was like, we need help today. Can you show up at four o'clock? And they did this whole interview and she talks about the thrill of being a part of that and her being in the room when I gave my victory speech and how she started crying and they all looked at each other and they were like, we did that. So this young girl who was 17 years old, took a government class, thought she might be interested, um, has taken ownership of the fact that her efforts helped propel me to Congress. You know, that's what it's supposed to be about. It cannot just be about the most important people or the people with the titles. Every single person has value and something to add. And I think that is probably where my greatest strength lies in pulling that out of people. And I think that that is where your greatest opportunity lies because you meet people from every stripe, every walk of life, you know, every background, every ethnicity, every income level. So to just pull those gifts out of them and then encourage them to pass it, pay it forward to someone else, I think is, is really, you know, the most compelling part uh, of the work and the most fascinating and exciting thing about the community college system. Thank you. Um, Ashley writes, the Capitol is in the midst of rolling out its brother to brother and sister to sister mentor program. This is now, uh, this has now been a, um, attached to the inaugural and exciting bridge to Morehouse initiative. We know and we know and research, we know research is indicative of the impact and need for representation at all levels of academic arenas and access to mentors and community resources and how historic and systematic barriers have continued to pose these challenges. What words, strategies, and gems can you share with us to carry back to our scholars about the magnitude of this momentous important of staying the course and the permission to be human through it all? Sorry, I know it was loaded. No, no, no. <laughs> wow, Ashley, good. feel free to talk. Go ahead. No, this is a perfect way to end this. Just love them. Show them that you care. Um, when I found out that I was nominated for Teacher of the Year in my building, and actually Connecticut Teacher of the Year, it wasn't because I sat down and I developed a strategic plan and said in four years, I'm going to win an award for the work that I'm doing. These are all of the things that I'm gonna to do to make sure that I am recognized and noticed. It was because I would, I just cared about my kids. I saw myself in so many of them, you know, I would walk around the building and, and you notice the kids who are disengaged. And I 
I, I watched a video of, of that was made at my school this morning. And there was this girl, her name was Sarah. And she was like, I don't even know how I met Miss Hayes. She just came out of nowhere. Uh, and I remember Sarah because Sarah was problematic and I went to the office and I pulled her schedule and I said, can you give me her schedule? And I just showed up at her class. I was like, I need to talk to you. And she was like, who are you? And why are you stalking me? And it was because I would notice her like after she was, she was, she was trouble. And I started showing up at her basketball games. I started, you know, going to her homeroom in the morning, you know, are you, were you late again today? Just taking an interest in her. And she started to respond to that. So when I saw, when I was nominated for teacher of the year and my principal was, you know, I kept getting observed and they kept coming through trying to figure out what I was doing differently. It's, I was protecting those kids from having to overhear a teacher talk about their family in the way that I heard that teacher talk about mine. I was making sure that they knew that someone in this building cares about you. You know, I would, it, it was deeply personal for me. I remember as a teacher, when we had open house, I would say to kids, if your parent can't make it, write the number down and I will make time to call each and every one of them. I remember we had a community center and a laundromat in, in one of our neighborhoods. And I would say, I'm going to be there from four to seven. If your mom or dad wants to talk to me, they can just walk down the street and talk to me because I wanted them to know that you are so important to me and I care enough about your success that I'm going to do whatever I have to do to meet you halfway. I think part of the challenge and what I see so many times, especially in our urban schools and our marginalized communities, is there's this expectation that you should already come with that. I shouldn't have to, if you don't have a printer at home, then that's your problem. I want the paper printed. And this is the format that I wanted in. And we really have to understand and appreciate that not everybody comes with that same background. Not everybody comes with that same level of experience. And it doesn't mean on any level that you have to lower the bar or lower the expectations, but it does mean that we have to meet them where they are and help them reach that bar. It, it did not hurt me as a teacher to let a student come to my class 10 minutes before and print out their report. And there are so many people, so many people in this profession who just don't get that, who just think that by exerting their authority in those places that they are doing their job as a teacher. And that's not what teachers are tasked with doing. So if there's a gem that you can take from me, show kids that you care and they will respond to that. They will do whatever they can to impress you, to please you, to meet your expectation, to rise to the occasion, to do everything that you are expecting them to do. And that doesn't happen by force. It happens because they want to be better. They want, somebody to, they want someone to believe that they can be better. And when they find that exact right person who does that, there is no limit to what, what, is, what is possible or what they can achieve. And you can't even pray for an outcome that's better than the one that you'll receive. If you just show kids that you care about them, um, that has been what this profession has gifted me with. People always ask me, you know, do you love your job? I don't love this job. <laughs> I don't love this job. It is. I like it. It's all right. I think I'm doing a pretty good job, but teaching is the only job that I've ever loved that loved me back that even when I thought I was going to break up with it and I was walking away and my hands were thrown up, I met a kid in the parking lot or something happened that just, just made me fall back in. And, and everybody doesn't get that. Every, you know, that is probably the greatest gift in my life to have been a small part, you know, to leave just this inspirational footprint in the lives of hundreds of kids who remember the one thing I did, uh, you know, the one thing I said that sticks with them. So, you know, just show kids that you care about them. You know, they don't care how many books you read, how many degrees you have. They don't care what background or information you bring. They care how you make them feel and they will respond to that. So I am so excited to hear that so many people on this platform are 
creating mentorship opportunities and opening your doors and going side, outside of your campuses and working with communities and bringing people in because that's the only way we navigate ourselves out of this. That's the only way we get through this. And, and I appreciate the work and the effort that you do to make sure that our community college systems are strong, that they are resilient, that they offer access and opportunities to people who otherwise would not have them. Um, I appreciate you because I am because of who you are. So thank you so much for your time this morning. I want to thank you. What a remarkable, remarkable talk when you said you were getting emotional at one point. I was getting emotional. I'm, I'm certain everyone here was also. At the end, you talked about being an inspirational footprint for your students, and you were one today for us. So we can't express our gratitude for your presence in our, our conference today. And I think also your recognition that we're all leaders, teachers, staff, administrators, we all impact our students' lives and we all sh show that we care about our students. So thank you for caring also. Thank you and enjoy your conference. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. We're gonna be going for a 15 minute break. There'll be a timer on the screen and then we'll come back in 15 minutes for our first breakout session. Uh, so take a break and we look forward to having you return as we continue our discussion of mentoring.